You will cover me with your feathers In your shelter I will find rest For the darkness will turn to dawning And the dawning to me I once was a rose but now I'm a flower I was blind but now I see was grace that taught my heart to hear and grace 
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Gorebridge Parish Church. Welcome, welcome, welcome. A big welcome to Elliot and Sarah, who are joining with us, I believe, from the Manchester area. Liverpool. Look, got to get that right. Now. <laughs> oh, I will resist any Scouse jokes until coffee time. It's lovely to have you. And, um, Elliot and Sarah study, uh, study with Joel on the rain course, and uh, it's just a joy to have you. And a welcome to everybody else who's visiting here as well, wherever you have come from. If I could have your attention, please, we will work our way through the notices. Monday Fellowship, the next Monday Fellowship will be on the 22nd of April, Amanda is coming. Bring your crochet hook and some wool. I know some of you will be quite excited about that prospect. CRP is back on on Tuesday. Do come along. If, like I keep saying, if you haven't been, you've got to come. Um, if you can on a Tuesday morning. So pop-up charity shop. Agnes and the team run a cafe. It is the most remarkable thing that we do. Our next new buyers will be on the 23rd of April, and uh, we'll be gathering with our brothers and sisters at New Buyers Village um, to worship. And the Wednesday Lunch Club is back on 12 noon for our over 65s. Thursday Community Meal is also at 12 noon, and one of the things about the Thursday Community Meal is that we have a citizen's advice worker there, so if you know anybody who's got any issues that might um, they might get some assistance. I had a phone call this week from someone saying, is that the Citizens Advice Bureau? Has my referral come through? And I had to untangle that one. So it's doing good work um, on a Thursday. And it's meal by donation, and the food is excellent. Thursday church is back this week. I have near Scooby what we're doing, but I'm hoping someone does. Alan put his finger up, that's great. He bid and sold to Pastor Eaglesham. Uh, we Scones is on this week too on the Friday, so 9.30 to 11.30, parents and toddlers and uh, a scone. For anybody you know who's needing some help in recovery, hurts, hang-ups, habits, whatever it may be, Joe, our recovery worker, runs a group called um, Bridge to Freedom. Joe is usually at the Thursday community meal, and Bridge to Freedom runs. Um, it's two till four, isn't it? I keep getting this. I need to amend the slide. Old slides keep reappearing, Alistair, but it's two o'clock to four o'clock. What is on there, though, is the mobile number for Joe if you wish to get in contact with him. There is a presbytery Zoominar. Just pause for a moment at the unlikeliness of those two words being in the same sentence. On the 30th of April, um, why does sharing faith often feel so dif difficult? Um, this uh, Start to Stir offering is something that Peter Woods put together. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send out the Zoominar details on the church email, which is a cute reminder to say, if you're not receiving our weekly updates, then let us have your um, email address. You can get to that through the website. If you put Gorebridge Parish Church into whatever search engine you use, you'll find it there. The next meeting place will be the first week in May, and the 5th of May, 6.30, for our evening worship. And thank you to everybody who helped make last Sunday such a meaningful time. A few announcements without which we can't do what we're supposed to do. Our annual stated meeting will be held after worship here on Sunday, the 21st of April. We're going to be having a bit of a vision cast 
as part of the service so you can understand what direction the church is going in. And there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers. And um, um, Ian, how are we going to make the accounts available to those who can't sleep? You've got an email copy, so we'll put that out on the email list so you can have a look at our accounts and uh, see if all the figures tally up. I guarantee you there's just a handful of people in this congregation who can actually make head or tail of them, but they still tell a story of God's faithfulness. Right, on the 25th of April at 7 p.m., Tim will be being ordained as assistant minister here. Um, it is a presbytery service. Tim has picked the worship. Even just for that, be there. Be there. Help. Uh, and it'll be, it's just going to be a wonderful celebration. Of course, this is an extension of Thursday church, but perhaps not with tables. But um, if there are any buns about, we'll just stick them in the corner with some coffee-making facilities. I'm sure that'll cheer presbytery up. But that's on the 25th of April at 7 p.m. here. For Tim's ordination and a wondrous and joyous occasion that shall be. Now, are you all sitting comfortably? Good. Gorebridge Parish Church edict for ordination and admission of elders. I better explain. Um, Gorebridge Parish Church is a Presbyterian church which I know has all sorts of associations, but all it means is that the leadership of the church is done by elders, presbyters, if you like. So here we go. Amanda Dodds. Yeah. Guy Johansson. Yeah. And Nathan Nicholas. Yeah. Members of this congregation have been elected by the Kirk Session to be ruling elders of this congregation. All have accepted office as elders. If anyone has any objections why any one or more of them should not be ordained and admitted to office, they should state their objection at a meeting of the Kirk session to be held in the small hall on Sunday the 28th of April 2024 at 10.30 a.m. If no relevant objection regarding life or doctrine is made and substantiated, the Kirk session will proceed to the ordination and admission of Amanda Dodds, Guy Johansson, and Nathan Nicholas at the immediately issuing diet of worship. On behalf of the Kirk session, Agnes Renton, session clerk. You have been duly noted. Now, just a wee detail. If the first we hear that you have a concern about the life or doctrine about any of those three individuals is at that meeting, that might put the cat among the pigeons. So do have a chat with us earlier, assuming that you know something that we don't know. Is that clear? Brilliant. We've got the formal bit out of the way. And if I do that next Sunday, then we can have some new elders. Oh, excellent. Now, are you ready to worship? Right. How do we start worship? With a psalm. Brilliant. Now, just a reminder that many of the Psalms are attributed to David. So we're going to read that this week as we read through Psalm 15. A Psalm of David. Let's read together. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent, who may live on your holy mountain, the one whose walk is blameless, and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to their neighbor and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person, <coughs> excuse me, those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Father God, we thank you for these words, for the way they describe a life full of godliness and wisdom, 
of kindness and gentleness, of an engagement with the well-being of others. We recognize as we gather as your church that we are brothers and sisters, that you have called us into that one great family, that whatever family name we have, whatever relationship we had with our earthly parents, that we have a good, good father. And that your faithfulness and love to us is like the best of father and mother. And that we are brothers and sisters in that great family. We recognize that in Jesus we have a brother. And in the Holy Spirit we have all the resources of love and compassion and forgiveness and wisdom that knit us all together. So while we're feeling fluffy about that, we recognize that's quite the task. For we're very different. We're very, very different in many cases, and that can be hard work. So we thank you like a wonderful jigsaw puzzle, you fit us together, that none of us contain the fullness of what it means to have the image of God, but that together we bear that image. Together we are a holy temple. Together we are the people of God. Together we are the ark in which things are saved. Together we are the church. So, Father, as we remind ourselves of that love we have for one another, we recognize that for our brothers and sisters in the church throughout Midlothian, throughout the Lothian and Borders area, in all of Scotland, the United Kingdom, around the world. And we pray that your church would be full of loving unity, that our witness to the wider world might be that. And this, that we love our neighbor. That we love our neighbor. That our love for one another and our love for you so fills us that we have an impact on those who share our postcode, our workplace, our football club, whatever it may be. And that in doing so, people would see you in us. Now we know how broken we are. And yet we trust by your grace that others would see Jesus in us, Father. That's the work of your spirit. For you have promised to complete the work that you have begun in us to raise us up to the full stature of Christ, which both blows our minds and terrifies us and, and, and undermines all of our, our plans on living an easy life. <laughs> but it also calls us into life in all its fullness. So thank you for our brothers and sisters. Thank you for our neighbors. And thank you that in the sacrificial loving of one another, we find out who you made us to be in Jesus' name. And we would go on praying, Lord Jesus, in the words which you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Friends, look around you. We have grown in size since we began, as is our want. Are you ready to worship? Let's, oh, hang on a minute. Are you ready to worship? Yay. Let's stand. Fraser, lead us. Let's send our words to the Lord in the form of prayer.
gets challenging, when we think the world is against us, let us lift up our eyes and turn to you. For this next hour and a half, for this next two hours, for the rest of the day, let's put our problems behind us just for this time. Turn our eyes to you and be grateful for what you have given us. Be thankful that those challenges that you have provided in our life, whether by your means or not, that you're with, they're with us, holding our hands, picking us up, carrying us, and that even though they may seem challenging, we can still get through it. Amen.
Wonderful. Okay, would you like to come down the front? We've got a story to share today. It's going to be a video story, so make sure you can see a screen. Now, we have been talking about the story from Samuel to David, but now we're telling the story from Saul to David. Because even though David has been anointed king at the age of 16, any 16-year-olds here? Wow, Janice, you're wearing well. Any 16-year-olds here. So he still had another 14 years to wait until he became king proper at the age of 30. Any 30-year-olds here? Yay! <laughs> There's lots of honorary, honorary age claiming going on. So, 14 years is a long time. Any of you guys here 14 years ago? No, 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 no. no. I remember some of you arriving. It was less than 14 years ago. Mind you, I remember some of you arriving. It was more than 14 years ago, Fraser. That's a, that's a thought. Now, it was 14 years between David's anointing as king and him becoming king properly. And in that time in between, he had a complicated relationship with the king Saul. Now, let me ask you a question. Does anybody here have a complicated relationship with anybody in this world? Let's see your hands. Okay, now put your hands down. Now put up your hand if you didn't just put up your hand and share. I am eager to hear your hints and tips about having no problematic relationships in your life. I have a funny feeling, and so does Ethan, I can see it on his face, that everybody here has complicated relationships with somebody. Hmm? Isn't that the truth? Okay. Unless, well, I suppose we've got Eldon up the back there. Maybe, maybe not Eldon. Uh, we've got Finley as well. Maybe not Finley. But just about everybody else has complicated relationships. Okay. So who's ready for a story? I'm ready. For, oh, nobody's ready for a story? No, some people are yawning. Come on, pass the popcorn. It's film time. Well, then you can pass it. God's story, David and Saul. So part of God's story is about two guys named David and Saul, and it begins like this. You may have heard of David before, the little shepherd boy who stood up to the massive warrior Goliath and won, but that isn't the whole story. In fact, that's really only a part of it. The rest of the story starts with a man named Saul. See, God wasn't very happy with Saul, Israel's first king. The people of Israel had begged God's prophet Samuel to give them a king so they could be more like other nations. God warned the Israelites they would regret it, but gave them Saul as their king. And like anyone, King Saul wasn't perfect and soon started to mess up, disobeying God and leading Israel away from him. And that's where our friend David comes in. God wanted a new king to replace Saul, so he sent Samuel to a man named Jesse. Jesse showed Samuel his eldest sons, big and strong men, Samuel thought for sure that one of these impressive boys was to be king, but God had other plans. God told Samuel to find another son, so Jesse brought in little David. Even though David was a little scrawny and had the smelly job of taking care of sheep, God told Samuel to look at more than his appearance. Samuel obeyed and anointed David, God's special way of choosing people. When David was anointed, the good spirit that had been helping Saul rule left him and was replaced with a new spirit that wouldn't leave him alone. Imagine there was a bee buzzing around in your brain that you couldn't do a thing about. That may be what it was like for Saul. Since Saul was going a little crazy, his servants had David, a great harp player, come to the palace and play music to calm the king. Now, one day, David came to bring his brothers, who were working as soldiers, some lunch. What started out as a lunch delivery soon turned into one of the most famous stories in the Bible, where tiny David took down the massive warrior Goliath with a single stone. After this, David was like a famous rock star. 
In fact, David was so popular that Saul worried people would start thinking David should be king instead. Saul began to try and kill, sending him on dangerous quests where any normal guy would have died and even threw a spear at his head once. Eventually, things got so bad that Jonathan, Saul's son, who David had become great friends with, helped David escape. David wandered for years trying to stay out of Saul's grasp. Twice, Saul even got so close that David had the opportunity to kill him. But David refused to kill the king in charge. David continued to flee from Saul for years, and without God's blessing, Saul's army was losing to the Philistines. Soon enough, Saul's army had been defeated. Jonathan had died, and the Philistines were now chasing them. Saul was so afraid of capture that he chose to fall on his own sword instead of letting the Philistines catch him. When David heard of Jonathan and Saul's death, he went out and avenged them. And with Saul dead, David returned to Israel and at last took his place as God's new king. And that's the story of David and Saul. So, in case you missed it, here's the quick version. God made Saul king. Saul disobeyed God. God said he would take the kingdom away from Saul and chose David. David became popular. Saul became fearful of David. David had to run away. David wandered for years. Saul died. David avenged Saul. David took over as Israel's chosen king. And that's a part of God's story. Thank you to Kids Club for putting together that. Wasn't that something? Okay, so now you're experts in the story of David and Saul. And for us grown-ups, we've had a reminder of how complicated it is. So, I said that most of us have complicated relationships with people. And it's different when we've got a complicated relationship with someone our age or younger or someone older. When it's someone our age or younger, we can pray for God's help and we can get the help of grown-ups and other people, big brothers and sisters, to help us to figure out how to sort a relationship that's difficult or maybe how to cope with it if we can't sort it. But it can be really difficult when it's someone who has responsibility for us. Anyone here ever had a tough relationship with a teacher? <laughs> a painful memory for some of the boys in this class. Indeed. Tough relationship with your teacher. And you can't change your teacher, can you? And you can't tell your teacher what to do, not without getting into trouble. And when things like that happen, we need to do two things. The first thing we need to do is we need to ask for God's help. Because God helped David, even though Saul was trying to kill him, sometimes wanted him in his house, sometimes wanted him dead. It was just up and down and up and down. He couldn't make, couldn't, couldn't make head or tail of it. So, t so pray to God for help. But the second thing is this. Find someone you trust and tell them it's not easy. So if you're struggling with your teacher or something like that, find someone you love to tell. Okay? That is a really important life lesson, isn't it, grown-ups? Because if you hang on to all the hard feelings about a difficult relationship, it can be really, really hard, and it can stay with you for a long time. So much so that when I talk about this later, there's probably going to be some grown-ups who are going to need a prayer and some time to share about how things have been for them. And they're all grown up. Right. So, David and Saul's relationship was complicated. And over the next weeks, we're going to be exploring what happened in the history there. But... Right now, what we're going to do before you head through to your groups is we're going to pray. Should we do that? Okay. Do you want to pray with me? No, I'll do a line. You do a line. How's that sound? But we don't know, we don't know how to pray. You don't know how to pray. Well, why don't I help teach you, Ethan? Okay. So quiet yourself. Put your hands on your lap. You can close your eyes if that helps. And just let the ones who are running around run around because that's what they do. You have to wait for the key to stop turning. And let's pray. 
Dear Father God. Okay, we need to run through the ground rules about this. If you want to pray with me, you need to repeat. You can repeat quietly on the inside, but I need at least three people to repeat after me. Dear Father God, thank you for your love. And thank you for your help. Even when it's hard. And we have trouble with other people. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for resources of forgiveness. And patience. When we get angry. Or we are hurt. Lord Jesus, Jesus, we pray pray that we would learn to forgive forgive and get help help when we need it, it. just as you you would have us do. do. In Jesus' name we pray. pray. Amen. 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 You guys are amazing. Of course, one or two of you are thinking, well, you can have difficult relationships with people who are younger than you. And that also is true. And the same wisdom applies. Pray for God's help and tell someone you trust. Okay? How's that sound? Well, it sounds really good, Mark. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you for saying so. Now, it's time for you to go through to your group. So if it's Sunday Club Crash or Huddle... Go through there and take a grown-up with you so that they can sign you over. And if it's youth group, you self-certify so you can head through this door here. Have a wonderful time and God bless you. Now, as the kids make their way through, just to say, I know some of you have been asking, when is a new members course going to be running? You will find out next week. But for those of you who like to be prepared to be prepared, I thought I'd give you an extra week's notice. And we'll be taking in new members on Pentecost. And if you don't know when that is, Google it. There we go. Other search engines are available.
thank you. What a wonderful image, isn't it, of the river of God. And just as we get started today, we're going to be touching on some difficult subjects like relational dysfunction and idolatry and violence. And I realize that that has an impact on us that's very personal. And so as we step into this, if anything rises up this week, anything at all, we will pray with you. I'll sit down here and you can come pray, share your story. It may be that will happen at another time. It might bubble up by the time Thursday church comes around. All of us have been wounded by difficult relationships, and many of us struggle with the guilt of having wounded others in tough relationships. But we're going to continue with that into the difficult story of Saul to David. Now, last week, Tim did a great job, didn't he? Just guiding us through this wonderful relationship that Jonathan has, Saul's son with David. In the course of the next chapters, they're going to make a covenant with each other. Jonathan is going to make steps to protect David, and I encourage you to take notice of this as we work our way through. That's the good side. Now we're going to look at the difficult side. And so for those of you who had a look at the, the, the YouTube link you would have seen or the email you'd have seen, the theme for today is the tyrannical king. Now, as we step into this passage in 1 Samuel 19, let me ask you, have you ever seen the misapplication of power? Okay? Now, I know that on one level it might be you were just in the shop for five minutes and couldn't the traffic warden have waited? <laughs> and... It's often that, or I was only doing five miles an hour over the speed limit, or some poor soul in London got done for doing 22 in a 20 zone at some silly time in the morning, which, ah, we all get a bit kind of salty about that. But I'm talking about the misapplication of power where it really hurts. You see, the task of every generation is to lay down its life for the next generation. It can take a generation a wee while to figure this out, but that is the task of each generation. Some of you know this, for you have had children. And having children is an exercise in meaningful self-sacrifice, is it not? That's what it is. Some of you have taken on difficult jobs to care, to set aside your life to care for a relative or for a child or for other people who are in need, to teach, social work and police work, to have the courage to build a business in order that other people can have meaningful employment that will make a positive difference in the lives of their families. And that resource is passed from generation to generation in terms of love and finance, whatever it may be. And one of the difficulties we have currently as a society is we've hiccuped. We've stopped having children. The birth rates, not just in the UK, but all across the world are plummeting. It seems that our response to the comfort and wealth that the modern world affords, even given its insecurities, causes us to think less of having children. And the old realities of bearing children and passing on trades and wisdom and culture and faith to our children and our children's children has broken down. That's one of the things that this church family here is responsible for restarting what I call the generational engine. Saul has an opportunity to do this. 
and he decides not to. And parent generation, when our generation is dysfunctional, it's often our children and our children's children who are the ones that suffer. Sober moment. But it's true. With that introduction, shall we dive into the scripture? Excellent. By the way, I think I've managed to shoehorn in one joke. So there will be a lighter moment. But that's it. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan had taken a great liking to David and warned him, my father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you and I'll tell you what I find out. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He's not wronged you. And what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Saul listened to Jonathan and took this oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. So Jonathan called David and told him the whole conversation he brought him to Saul, and David was with Saul as before. Once more, war broke out, and David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled before him. But an evil spirit from the Lord came on Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand. And while David was playing his lyre, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear. But David eluded him. Saul drove the spear into the wall, and that night David made good his escape. Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and to kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, warned him, if you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. So Michal let David down through a window, and he fled and escaped. Then Michal took an idol and laid it in the bed. Um, open brackets, what the hang was that doing in the house? Close brackets. Covering it with a garment and putting some goat's hair at the head. When Saul sent the men to capture David, Michal said, he's ill. Then Saul sent the men back to see David and told them, bring him, up, bring, him, bring him up to me in his bed so that I may kill him. But when the men entered, there was the idol in the bed and at the head was some goat's hair. Saul said to Michal, why do you deceive me like this and send my enemy away so that he escaped? Michal told him, he said to me, let me get away. Why should I kill you? And when David had fled and made his escape, he went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Samuel, Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel went to Naoth and stayed there. And the word came to Saul, David is in Naoth at Ramah. What word came to Saul? that David was in Naoth at Ramah. So he sent men to capture him, but when they saw a group of prophets prophesying, with Samuel standing there as their leader, the Spirit of God came on Saul's men, so they also prophesied. Saul was told about it, and he sent more men, and they prophesied too. Saul sent men a third time, and they also prophesied. Finally, he himself left for Ramah and went to the great cistern at Seku, and he asked, where are Samuel and David? Over in Naoth at Ramah, they said. So Saul went to Naoth in Ramah. But the Spirit of God came even on him, and he walked along prophesying until he came to Naoth. He stripped off his garments, and he too prophesied in Samuel's presence. He lay naked all that day and all that night. And this is why people say, is Saul also among the prophets? Open brackets, not what the hang was the king doing being Bufty Bill? Close brackets. Weird, right? Just weird. What are we supposed to make of all that? I love John Ortberg's insight to Genesis. He says, if God can work through that family, he can work through yours. 
That's a great, that's a great insight. Let's see what we can get from this. So just to recap, Jonathan and Michael, Mikael, as I can never decide how to pronounce it. When I call her Michael, it sounds wrong. Maybe I should just call her Mike. So the king's son and daughter have helped David escape. The king has said on an oath, I'm not going to kill him, and then tries to skewer him like a boar to the wall of his chamber. The spirit leaves him, the spirit comes back and he prophesies, and he does the naturist speaking oracles of God thing in the grass. I haven't tried it myself. I'm not going to try it. There are so many good jokes to say about that, but this is live streamed and I'll be taken out of context. Now, you can imagine them yourselves. It's just the weirdest passage and it's going to be followed by equally weird passages. But what what the writer of 1 Samuel is doing now is taking us from the point where David is declared king to replace Saul and this 14-year period where David is in the wilderness because he's not going to be king till he's 30. Lots of resonances. You know the Bible resonates. When did Jesus start his ministry? When he was 30. How long was Paul in Syria preparing for his missionary journeys? 14 years. And you just get these echoes all the way through the Scriptures that they're just there to remind you. And by the way, when you're all thinking about, what do you mean an evil spirit for the Lord? Does the Lord have a pocket full of evil spirits? You know, that's he's kind of like... The BFG in is a nasty nightmare to give to somebody. Hmm? Is it? That's obviously not the case. But what did God do to Pharaoh? Hardened his heart. And there's that sense of God's agency is at work in people who, even the wicked things people do, God can work for good. You get that in Romans 8, don't you? So there's all sorts of things going on in here. Samuel the prophet is still prophesying. He's not got long to live, but there he is. And the word of the Lord from Samuel seems to be protecting David because David is God's anointed. We'll come to the idea of the skewering of God's anointed later. Here's a picture, this is one that Tim's used, where a very kind of, ah, David. (laughs) He doesn't look like butter would melt in his mouth, hmm? Yep. Not much foreskin collection going on there. (laughs) It was last week. Some of you weren't here, you got a shock, I apologize. Saul is trying to kill David. No, hang on a minute. No, he's not trying to kill David. No, he is trying to kill David. No, he's not. But he is. No, he's not. Thank you. Yes, he is. No, he's not. When are you pointing out that's Goliath? Keep up. Goliath was one thing. You see, Goliath was just an enemy. Yes? An enemy, pure and simple. Goliath's busy saying, am I a dog that you come up with sticks and stones? I'll feed your rotting corpse to the birds. And other lovely epithets like that. And David just knows he has... What does David have to do in Goliath's presence? Oh, come on. Kill him. He, or or what, what was the politically correct term? He needs to make him metabolically challenged. Or my favorite... Terminally different. (laughs) He needs to kill him. (laughs) He needs to kill him. 
If you've got an enemy in front of you, if the Lord gives you something to deal with in your life, you know, if you're jealous like Saul, what does the Lord expect of you? Deal with it. There's power in the cross to deal with your jealousy, okay? If you leave church and go, hmm, at someone else's car, or suit, or my shirt. Do you like my shirt? Absolute. Okay. This is very muted for me. But it's a tough subject today. Then you can ask the Lord to help you. You can deal with it. It's just an enemy sat right in front of you. You know it's not meant to be part of your character. Okay? You're just dealing with an enemy. That's one thing. But Saul's completely different. Who's Saul? Saul's the king of Israel. He was the Lord's anointed. He's the one that Samuel put oil on and took him from being a donkey herder to make him the king of Israel. He was the one who is still king. And repeatedly, and we'll see this, David won't lift a hand to him. Even though Saul does not show the same respect for him. David is, uh, sorry, Saul is quite another thing. Right, let me introduce you to a concept, push and pull in relationships, okay? Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not. Push and pull, push and pull. Sometimes they're pushing you away, sometimes they're pulling you in. There are mental health conditions that can make that a part of, you know, things like bipolar, um, borderline personality disorder, depression can... You can get push and pull in relationships where those things are at work. And as often when we're praying for people, the Lord will say to us, it's not their fault. But also you can have things worked into your character that mean that you are Mr. or Mrs. Inconsistent. Push and pull, push and pull. And that's what Saul does. One minute he wants David there because when David's there and he's going plinky, 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 the Lord's my shepherd, Saul is eased. But then it can snap in a moment. Out comes a spear. Some of you are going, I wonder if I know anybody like this. Okay. If you have anyone in your life where it's like Christmas Day when they behave themselves, (laughs) <laughs> I heard that. If you've got anyone in your life where it's like, woohoo, we had a good day, there's push and pull in that relationship. And you've got to watch. If other people are going, oh, thank goodness, when you behave well or I behave well, then we've got issues to deal with. You hearing me? Oh, you just want to go to church. The tyranny of the unpredictability. I know that some of you grew up with parents who were pathologically unpredictable. I know some of you have been in or perhaps still in relationships where people are pathologically unpredictable. You cannot tell what's coming next. And that is a profound source of suffering. Are you hearing me? You should be able to fall into your parents' arms or whoever brought you up's arms and know that they will love you. But for many of us, that's not been the case. And this story of David And Saul stops being this weird tug of war, this weirdness that we go, what's that about? And it comes right close. And if you've lived or are living in that kind of unpredictability, it takes all your energy to try and maintain a relationship. That can be with a parent, it can be with a sibling, it can be with a child, it can be with a spouse or a partner or whoever it is. <coughs> it can be in a friendship. The tyranny of unpredictability. 
All I'm going to say is eventually David finds himself where? In the wilderness. Because he has to remove himself from that proximity. When it's your parent, it's very difficult to do that. But that may actually be what you need to do. Right. Why are we talking about this? Well, first of all, God's suffering matters to you. He collects your tears in a jar, so says the psalmist. The second reason is that if that has been our experience of that push and pull, what we expect from our enemy, what we would expect from our enemy has now become something we experience in a family relationship or a friendship or something of that order. And that has a perverse consequence. Because it's very easy if we haven't known a good father, a good mother, a good brother, a good son, whatever it may be, a good friend. If we've been, if we've been hurt in those situations, then it's awful easy to project that onto God. It's also made easier that if you read some of these narratives in isolation, God can seem capricious at times. Let's just be honest about it. And we'll come on to that because Jesus himself knew this. That the portrayal of God in an easy surface reading of many of the scriptures in the Old Testament gives us the sense that God is either unfair or unpredictable, whatever it may be. The reality is very far from that truth. But we're vulnerable to it because so much of our experience of broken relationships involves this kind of push and pull. And if we've suffered with that push and pull, it's very easy for us to project that suffering on the, that, that broken relational stuff onto God as if God's going to behave like our, you know, unpredictable dad or our unpredictable friend or frankly, our unpredictable self. Now, the Bible has a word for this. It's called idolatry. When we attribute to God things that do not belong to God, we're worshiping a false image of God, and that's idolatry, you know, which you get stoned for in the Old Testament. Can you hear me? That's just to say it's serious. But it's quite possible that many of us are walking around with a false image of God tucked away deep inside of us. And the work of the Holy Spirit is to unpick, well, as, as Francis Frangipan loves to say, to cut our unbiblical cords. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Do tyrants figure, oh, but probably better say this. Um, See, when I say the word tyrant, if you haven't lived under a tyrant, you might expect that tyrants are mean all the time. But they aren't. Apparently, Hitler was wonderful with children. Except uh, every day, I get a colored photo of a child that was killed in the Holocaust, my YouTube feed, and a little bit about their story. So he wasn't good with those children. The complete opposite. But tyrants can actually, they have their moments of, you know, because that kind of buys you in, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Tyrants are rarely bad all the time to everybody. Right, now I've made that point. Do tyrants figure in Jesus' life and teaching? Think. Can anybody think of where a tyrant might appear in the Jesus story? Herod? So Herod the Great, when Jesus was born, what does he do? He says, oh, tell me where he is. So the Magi he says, I may go worship him. What does he actually do? He sends out a death squad to Bethlehem. To murder a generation of boys. And you think, oh, that's terrible. 
Mind you, in China, during the one-child policy, that murdered a generation of girls. But that's another story. There's a tyrant at work. But also, because some of you think, how long did Herod live? Herod Tetrarch, his son, who's Herod when, when Jesus is being tried, he figures in the story too, and he was a brutal tyrant. So the Herods, yes. Any, any others? Pilate? Caiaphas, ooh, Caiaphas the high priest. Yes, it's better for one person to die for the nation than the nation to suffer. I have a funny feeling I might meet Caiaphas one day. That will be an interesting chat. Mind you, we'll be surprised who we meet. We really will. Okay, Caiaphas. Yes, and I made mention of Pilate. Pilate was brutal. Brutal. He really was. I know that you can read the story and you think, oh, he was in a tough situation. He was, but his suppression of, of rebellion was, yeah, nothing you characterize as humane. Any, any other tyrants? God, oh, Quintus. Oh, yes. Oh, blimey. We're getting deep in Acts now. Yes. There's all, there's all sorts of... Um, there's all sorts of people in and around the story, historical figures. But the ones that we don't think about so much, perhaps, are the tyrants in Jesus' teaching. Who remembers the parable of the talents? Matthew 25, you know, a ruler's going away. He says, right, here's, I mean, it's bags of gold here in this translation, all right? But that's really all a talent is, it's gold coin. And he gives five talents to one servant, two talents to the other. It's probably a bit salty about that, yeah? And one to the last one. So the five talent guy goes off and invests it and gets how much back? Five again, so he's now got 10 talents. And we pick up the story when Jesus is talking to the, um, to, to the second servant who had two talents, two bags of gold. And this is cue from my joke. I wish I had the visual up, but um, uh, Liam Somerville sent me a, uh, a thing on WhatsApp this week which said, well done is for good and faithful servants, not stakes. I agree. Now, <laughs> Mr. Hudson would not agree. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came back and said, oh, is it the two bag of gold guy doubled his money. Sorry. I, thought, I clipped it a bit tighter than I thought. Then the man who received one bag of gold, this is Jesus speaking, came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put the money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I'd have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. Economists call this the Matthean principle after Matthew's gospel, which is that those who have wealth will accrue more wealth, and those who don't have wealth will struggle. Who taught that parable? Jesus. Did Jesus know that God was loving? Yes, he did. And yet, who's God in this story of the talents? You know, the parable of the talents, does God factor in here? He's probably the ruler. How does Jesus typify the ruler? It's a hard man. The ruler doesn't say, oh, no, I'm lovely. Come and have a hug and try again. Maybe put it in the bank this time and we'll get some interest. Go on, give you a second chance because otherwise you'll have me up with HR and I'll be in trouble. Yeah? It's none of that. The way that God is portrayed in this story for the God figure is that he's a hard man. Oh, you think, oh, that's an exception to the rule. What about the parable of the unjust judge? 
There's a widow who wants justice and goes to the unjust judge and says, give me justice, give me justice. Jesus is teaching about prayer. And who's God in that story? The unjust judge. And he goes, minute, 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 minute. Because I paraphrase. You know, it's my version of the message, right? Paraphrase of a paraphrase. Because you've bugged me so much, go on, have your justice, and off you go. That's... What is Jesus doing portraying God as, as if he's not the God who actually you see in Luke 15, where you've got the parable of the lost son? Yes? And there's, there's God sitting at the front porch looking for his son to return. The only problem is for the fatted calf. Oh, yeah, and the grumpy elder brother, but we can talk about that again. So what was all that about? Life experience in a fallen world when we have limited perspective can make God look cruel. Yes? Now, come on, take off those Sunday best attitudes, right? We've sung all the fabby songs, and that's great. But there are songs we could sing from the Psalms, God, where are you? The wicked prosper, the poor suffer, where are you? You have abandoned me. As Jesus quotes, famously from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Psalm 22 goes on to say, I am less than a worm. And even those of you who are good at self-deprecation would struggle to beat that one. Why is God portrayed as wicked in these stories? Or hard or tyrannical. First of all, read Kings and Chronicles and find out how many good kings the Israelites had had. And the answer is, not many. Well done. That's it. Not many. And all the imperial powers that Daniel prophesies in Daniel 7 as they're waiting for their 70 times 7 to come to pass, those tyrannical powers were not that brilliant either. When Paul wrote in Romans 13, respect the civil authorities, God has given them authority over you to limit sin and to, you know, promote righteousness and order, all that sort of stuff. He was talking about the Roman Empire who put his Savior to death. So this was not, you know, check that in with the ombudsman. These were awful places to live, except that chaos and anarchy were worse. And so the experience of the people to whom Jesus was speaking have experienced this. Now, let me tell you a very uncomfortable truth, which was probably underlined when the Ayatollahs and the president in Iran decided to lob a couple of hundred ballistics in the direction of Israel yesterday. Most of the world live in a regime like that. Are you hearing me? Most of the world. We are unfathomably blessed. And yes, we get in our muddles. And yes, you know, prime ministers break lockdown rules. But thank God we can get in a fizz about that. Because in much of the world, in much of the world, much of human experience runs like that. And actually, even here, a fifth of our children grow up with an alcoholic parent. About half of our children don't grow up with our birth dad. And a third of that half never see him. And for some of them, that's a blessing. But for some of them, that's a curse. The reality of life, the suffering that you go through, that we go through on a national scale, on a personal scale, is so hard that actually stories that typify God, the, the kind of reality that God oversees as being pretty darn brutal 
actually speaks to us even though we know that's not the character of God. Right. Let me ask you a question. As we look at the story of the atonement, of that cross that you can see through the stone rolled away, is that the story of a tyrannical father. On one level, you'll, yeah, you'll do what you're told. Yeah, yeah, it can. You can see it as the story of a tyrannical father. One preacher who rubs me up the wrong way, and so therefore I will not name out of Christian grace, described some theories of the atonement as cosmic child abuse. We know what it is for a father to demand unworkable stuff from their sons. And we've just passed Easter, and we know the stories. The story of Saul and David was embedded in Jesus' consciousness. What can we say about the atonement where Jesus dies on our behalf? Now, we do not have time to do this in detail. But I think for some of us, when we approach Easter, we struggle with Good Friday. We struggle because it kind of looks this way to us. The atonement, the rescue of us, was necessary. That's the first thing I'll say. No one can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for them. We were sold out to the enemy. And you know what to do with an enemy, right? The enemy's right in front of you. Satan's right in front of Jesus. All he needs to do is put a stone in his forehead. All he needs to do is beat him. And so the cross is that moment where the enemy's plans for this world are unseated, even the wickedness that was to come. Yes? The second thing is this, not, this isn't the father demanding of the son. For the son and the father are one. The son, the father, and the spirit are one. This is why we confound the Jehovah's Witnesses who come to our doors. This is why Islam split off from Christianity. is because they couldn't cope with this. But we don't worship three gods. We worship one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that which the son went through, the father went through too. Do you hear me? What happened at the cross was a co-conspiracy of Father, Son, and Spirit, our one God, in order that we might be rescued. It is the story of world creation restoring faithfulness. The only hope we ever had the faithfulness of our one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you can look at the story of the atonement and split the Father and the Son off, and then it starts to look screwy, but you have to hold them together. As Jesus himself said, I only do what I see the Father doing before me. Some of you have seen the shack. I saw it first last week. And one of the most moving parts of that is the representation of God the Father. There's this gorgeous black woman. She's got nail scars too. Paul knew his scriptures. And he knew the history. And he'd met with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And when he is communicating that world restoring faithfulness of God, he describes it like this. 
This is from Ephesians 1. I know this is a dear scripture to many of you. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Open brackets. Good Father. Close brackets. Yeah? Everything. All the bags of gold. All the answered prayer. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be homely and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Just a reminder for those of you who don't remember, the word for sonship there is the word for heir. The son who inherits. That counts for girls too. To the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. How did he give us his glorious grace? In him we have redemption through his blood. Paul describes it. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. That's the work of the cross. With all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ, or the Messiah to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, <coughs> to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. In order, with the result that, we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of His glory. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you are marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. And for every Jew who put their trust in Jesus, and if this doesn't make the hair stand up on the back of your neck, you're not paying attention. David avoided being pierced by Saul. The son of David was pierced for our transgressions, says the prophet Isaiah. And the result of that is that his resurrection life and forgiveness are available to the whole world. Friends, friends, friends. That's the river. And it's right here. May we pray. Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you that you have redeemed us, saved us, that we might be praised to your glory as we put our trust in you. Precious Jesus, reshape us as parents and as brothers and sisters, as children, as grandparents, as neighbors and friends, in the image of our faithful Heavenly Father, with the love of our extraordinary Jesus, all of which is available to us by the indwelling presence of the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of our Father, that seal that has been put on us as our adoption is made sure. And Father, however dysfunctional our families, our marriages, our communities, the nations where we came from, however dysfunctional they are, we pray for your blessing on those. Those people who come to mind as we work through this difficult stuff. And as a church, we pray your grace and healing on those who are hurt and suffer. But we also praise you that we are invited to participate in the most functional family that has ever been. The family of Jesus. The children of Abraham by faith. 
And so we pray, Lord, for peace for Jerusalem, for peace in our families, for peace in our hearts and our minds and our bodies, for peace in our land, in our church. We pray for the peace that passes all understanding to do everything that we cannot do in our own strength. And Lord Jesus, if we still have the hanging threads and scars of that which was not as intended, where we have suffered under hard taskmasters, where we have suffered under unjust judges, where we've suffered under a soul, where we've suffered under the enemy, bring liberty and freedom to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I would just repeat the welcome to come forward for prayer afterwards. She's a beloved wee sweetheart. Little daddy's just crashed. Isn't that great? Isn't that great we get to do church with every generation? Yeah, so may that be. Just a reminder that I'll be sat over there and I'll sit there as long as it takes. Okay? And if any of the prayer ministry team want to help out too, that would be brilliant. Ah, a drummer has appeared. Then we shall worship. Let's stand. There is over 50 countries where we cannot stand up today and praise the word, word of the Lord. So let's celebrate as we sing about him and be so grateful that we have this opportunity to do so. Oh, powerful, 
Untamable, all struck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, you are amazing, God. You are amazing, God. Amen. Amen. Let's speak this blessing over one another. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless. Perhaps see you through for coffee time if you need to get going. It's been wonderful having you if you've been joining with us online. Thank you so much for being with us today. God bless now.